Okay. Let's see, Rod, Rod Kane there. I see lots of people here. I'll, I'll mute myself. <laughs> good morning. Hey, Rod, how are you? Good, good, good. Good to see some familiar faces from. Um, good morning, everybody. Isolation. Morning. <laughs> Isolation. Morning, everybody. Before it gets um, um, chaotic in any way at all, can we just make sure everybody has their phones, their uh, microphones on mute? Um, I can just imagine how entertaining a conversation with 300 people um, would be. Yeah. Okay, Emily, we ready to go? We are indeed ready to go. Thank you very much. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the um, the first of our 30-minute coffee break uh, discussions um, here, um, hosted by uh, the Agile Business Consortium and J-Curve. Uh, the idea is that we'll be holding one of these on the last Wednesday of every month, so the next one will be uh, the 27th of May, uh, and we'll spend 30 minutes or so discussing things to do with uh, uh, agility, uh, and not just the current um, coronavirus stuff, but agility uh, in general and in a broad sense. Uh, I'm really, really pleased that I've got Vikram Jain, who's MD of J-Curve, um, with me to have a chat um, this morning. And we're going we're gonna to have a look at um, how agility can help in well, these challenging times. And, and I think, you know, what we're hearing from, from the consortium is uh, people have gone through the first phase of reaction, which is, oh my God, what do we do? Uh, and now are thinking very, very seriously about what does next look like? And actually next is probably the most important thing facing us now. Of course, many, many people are still, well, still struggling to survive, frankly, and, and that probably isn't going to end immediately uh, for some people. However, where we can, we need to start thinking about what's the strategic response to this, because this is not just going to go away in a hurry, and it may not be the last crisis that we face. So, Vikram, thinking about that requirement for people to think in strategic terms about next, um, what do you think uh, people should be thinking about in terms of agility? Uh, well, first of all, morning everyone, and uh, thanks for dialing in um, for today. I know you're probably very busy on dealing with, the, with all the things around the crisis. Um, I, just to quick introduce, introduce myself, so I, I look after a company called J-Curve, and our, our mission in life is to help increase the UK's agility. And we're really privileged to probably work with um, maybe 10 to 15% of the FTSE 100 exec, uh, as well as uh, several charities, their taxes, et cetera, as well. And I guess, um, just to answer your question then, Sir John, so one thing we're seeing right now is that um, at an exec level, we're seeing that there, there is now a little bit of space and headroom now where uh, the, the teams can start looking a bit further ahead than the next couple of days and the next couple of weeks. Um, and I guess uh, one thing we've obviously got to acknowledge is there's probably unprecedented levels, unprecedented levels of uncertainty. And you know, not, not to kind of overuse the old adage, but I mean, the only thing which is certain is that there is lots of uncertainty. And this is where it's fundamentally different now is because you know, there's uncertainty in terms of what's gonna happen in the next maybe week, a month, uh, quarter, half a year, and clearly what's going to happen in 12 months as well. And give you a couple of examples. I mean, working with some retailers in, in the UK, but also who are global, you know, and, and what we're seeing, for example, the retailers are looking at what's going on in China right now. You know, and as the markets have opened, we're seeing that retail behavior is that um, customers are going shopping perhaps on the weekday, but they're voluntarily self-isolating in the weekends. You know, these scenarios we wouldn't be able to plan for. Uh, and I guess so... You know, with, with all of that kind of uncertainty of what is going to happen, what is that new normal going to look like in a week? And it will change again in a month. It will change again in a quarter. It will change again in a year. Um, with all of that uncertainty, clearly this is where kind of agile ways of working uh, are really, really kind of uh, important and values. And I guess for all the people on the call who I imagine are agile practitioners, this is a really big opportunity, I think, for us to really help our leadership teams and our businesses navigate that crisis in the best possible way yeah do you think um the, just think about that because there's a there's a lovely i think it was um was it blackrock used to have an advert that said there are two times in life two occasions in life when people need capital now and later and i remember thinking that we could apply that to absolutely everything and this idea of the strategic response of course we need that later because that's that comes next at the same time there needs to be the mindset now to be able to 
um, to think about and to implement that strategic response. Um, are you seeing that in your clients and in the inquiries you get? Yeah, yeah. So we're starting to see, and we're working with organisations now, where what they're, what they're doing is they're basically setting up, you've got your crisis team, which is effectively managing the day-to-day, -day, keeping the business going, keeping the wheels on the roads. And we're starting to see now with organisations where they're, they're setting up agile teams uh, aligned around specific time horizons. So, for example, uh, one of our clients, which is a large global retailer, what they've done is they've set up a, a horizon team looking just at the next month, uh, another one looking at the quarter, another one looking at the next six months, and another one looking at what the potential new normal, normal looks like. Um, and for each of those uh, horizon teams, these are kind of agile teams, uh, and effectively what their roles are is to basically define what the vision is, what, you know, what, what potential scenarios and what would that vision look like in the next month. Um, that, that's one thing. The second thing is then building a backlog of a potential, um, maybe no regret act outcomes or activities, but at the same time is also what are the potential uh, outcomes and activities which may happen and what will trigger those. And then they're basically, then they're responsible for executing those no regret actions, as well as then monitoring what's going on in the market to constantly refine and prioritize the backlog as, as life changes. So I guess if I can give you an example, that, um, take that retail example. So in the next month, we're looking at, uh, with the retail at the moment, you know, what are the scenarios around shopping behavior or shoppers behavior as the market starts to reopen? Um, and, you know, a scenario would be that, you know, all goes back to normal. That would be great, wouldn't it? Uh, another scenario is that shoppers basically stay away from the physical stores. And obviously, maybe another scenario is that there's a kind of a, a medium between people kind of being very cautious and still a huge dependency just on digital channels as well. Um, so each one of those scenarios comes with a, a set of backlog items. Um, some of them are uh, almost, you could categorize them as no regrets. We should do it anyway. Let's invest in digital, make sure we've got the bandwidth, make sure we've got the, the service capability, um, because maybe there's an assumption that the new normal is that there is going to be a big shift to digital anyway. Um, but some things are going to have uh, trigger points as well. So each of those basic horizon teams are contributing to a, kind of an almost a, a large backlog, which then the executive team can help refine and prioritize. And as things happen, they can execute really, really quickly. That's really interesting because the, you think about those um, those no regrets items, if you like. I think it was, um, it was uh, Jeff Bezos who said, um, focus always on what doesn't change. Consumers will always want lower prices and faster delivery, for example. So Amazon always focuses on that. It must be quite a challenge for some teams to be able to identify those no regrets items, those things that definitely need to be done, knowing full well that, that actually whatever happens in the time horizon they're looking at, those things will still be needed. And it's, is it a challenge for people to identify those things, do you think? Yeah, yeah, for sure. And, you know, I guess, um, I guess what we're seeing with organisations is that the, the best way to deal with this is just, um, it's just basically constantly prioritise the backlog based on risk and based on value. And, you know, right. We're looking at the backlog in terms of opportunity, and threats, uh, saying, okay, well, what is the highest threat or opportunity we should be working for? And at least then the leadership team can start making calculated, uh, I guess, bets on what, what's going to happen. Yeah. Um, you know, and r rather than, uh, we've seen it in the last couple of weeks, is that there's definite kind of very kind of re reactive reflex action approach to just dealing with things. But this will allow businesses to really have a much more kind of um, provide a bit more science to managing the backlog and prioritization. Do you think it helps? Because I was just thinking particularly, uh, we think about the retail sector, for example, um, we are all customers of the retail sector. So actually yeah. we all have a mindset that tells us over the course of the next few months, dependent upon what happens, this is how my retail behavior is going to play out. Do you think it helps actually that, that the in a sense, not only the supply side, but the demand side is affected by this. Does it, help, does it help in getting that mindset for predicting what will be the no regrets activities? Um, so does, it, does it help in terms Yeah, of does it help the fact that actually we can think in, term, in personal terms about the way we're going to behave? Can we extrapolate from that to the way organizations ought to behave as well? Yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, obviously, I think that from a company perspective, I think the most important thing is to kind of just be observing what's going on in other markets, you know, and getting, using data to drive decision-making. Yeah. Um, and again, this is, I guess, the power of kind of agile teams that we've seen 
in these uh, scenarios where they are running these kind of horizon projects, it's typically to have a cross-functional team made up of, you know, data analytics teams, yep. um, made up of, uh, I guess, uh, you know, uh, customer experts, strategists, operations who can then prepare to respond, et cetera. And that will give you a much better quality outcome. Um, and I'll give you an example. I mean, we're working with a, a large retailer, um, uh, basically a, sh a supermarket retailer in the UK at the moment. And uh, a few years ago, their remark was that data wasn't really uh, used as much and it wasn't at the table when they were making decisions. Um, what's fascinating now is that we've got a lot more data to hand and we've got the data analytics teams now at the leadership team table, basically everyone turns to them to say, okay, well, what, what's the data telling us, which will help us then prioritize our backlog. Right now, and, and what's really interesting about that, I think, is um, data is a, is a picture of the past, essentially. It, could, it can't be a, a picture of the future. However, the analytics process is what tells us the trends in that data are giving us the opportunity to predict at least a little way into the future. Um, do you think outside of, of retail, for example, which has been using data and analytics for a very long time, do you think outside of that sector, there are many sectors which are actually capable of using analytics effectively to do some of that um, horizon planning? Yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, like, I, I don't think it really discriminates across all the different sectors. Um, whether, it, you know, we're working with oil and gas organisations right now, looking at uh, risk and risk management. Yep. Uh, and kind of you know, even just whether it's uh, engineering uh, resilience and things like that. Um, they, yeah, they're able to use data much more now than they've ever been before. Which there's more sensors in, the, in their pipes and stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's great. And, and one of the things that I think that characterizes um, agile teams is their ability not just to respond adaptively, but to respond at pace. Mm -hmm. uh, and, I, and I think the, um, the pace of, dare I say it, the pace of change that's going on at the moment is something that is not anything that any of us have been familiar with um, in the past. Added to that, the scale of change, you think about every, almost everything in our lives is actually different, whether positive or negative now. Um, the normal behaviors, if I, can, if I can use that term, that we associate with agile teams, um, are you seeing in your clients that those, um, in a sense, almost the classic agile behaviors, are they the ones that are being deployed or are, are there new things emerging? In a sense, is agile becoming more agile in response to, to the demands of the situation we're in now? Yeah, yeah. I think, I think it's, and I'm sure everyone on the call has probably got an opinion on this, but um, yeah. We've done a couple of polls in the last couple of weeks with our clients to, to do a kind of health check on how, how people are going. Um, and I'd say what was really fascinating about the results that we've seen so far is that those organizations where they have more maturity around agile ways of working have definitely been able to respond better to uh, working in kind of isolation, as an example. Um, you know, so. Uh, I've got two clients. One's just started on their journey uh, of introducing Agile Ways of Working. Another one, they've been doing it for the last few years and using that approach from exec through to the front line. Um, the, 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 the kind of the, the first, the former organization, they're really struggling with basically managing the teams because they're not used to uh, empowering the organization, uh, trusting the teams to get on with what they do. And also they're not used to um, communicating in much more dynamic nature. Mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, one of my clients is a, from a large insurance company was saying that, you know, what's really hard is like, you know, we, we, we have to kind of engage with 20 people to get a decision made. So, I, you know, he goes around all the people's desks uh, and basically, you know, says, look, this is what we're going to pass through the steering group. And then we'll finally present it to the steering group and everyone says, oh yes, of course we agree to the thing. Where obviously that's quite an inefficient way, but it's been, um, almost the, the tide's gone out and that's been drastically kind of um, exposed now because of the, this kind of new way of working. So that, that's kind of what we're seeing is that Agile is definitely giving everyone a benefit uh, if you're using it really well. Yep. Um, and also it's forcing organizations to use those Agile basics anyway. Uh, absolutely. And, and I, I did a blog recently called Enforced Agility. And I think that's the, the, the situation that we're basically um, all in. How do we... And, and I'm talking not just about the consortium or about Jacob, I've talked about all of us on this call as a, as a community, really. How do we help those organizations who are challenged in their journey to becoming more agile 
actually access the resources that they need, you know, and in a sense of, of connecting people with one another, for example, and offering opportunities to engage with them. Because of course, as you quite rightly said, some people are further down that, that road than, than others. Yeah, and I guess maybe this is a kind of a call to action. And I, look, I, I'm not sure what everyone's been doing. Um, I think it is really important right now that, you know, we've got like 130 or 40 people on the call right now. I mean, I guess what can we all do in this situation? I mean, we've been reaching out to all, all our clients, all our executive team members, basically just to provide more training, more awareness of this way of working um, and providing kind of support for them as they manage through this. Uh, I think that's really important that we all do that, really. Um, obviously, we can look after our own particular teams, but it's really important just to kind of offer up as much support as possible to as many, yeah. uh, many colleagues as possible to support them. Yeah, the, the key word there is the, this word community, really, actually, because we, we um, in a sense, we represent, and um, I was almost said the word salvation. I don't mean that in a, in a ridiculous, extravagant sense. Actually, a, a solution is probably a better way to describe it. Um, I, 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 I'm going to, um, in a second, I'm going to to um, to run a poll in, in just a couple of minutes, um, because each each time we do one of these each month, we'll be asking you, the audience, to decide what uh, subject we cover in the next one. So I'm gonna run a poll on that in just a second. We will though keep the conversation going whilst I do that, and then we'll another, run a poll at the end to see how people feel. But in the meantime, I, one question I wanted to ask Vikram was around the horizon teams, so we're looking at quarterly, six months, and you know, a year and, and beyond, stuff like that. One of the things that strikes me that might be very important is the connectivity between those teams, because of course, you know, a horizon is not actually a line in the sand. It, it's in a sense, it's rolling just in, in, in the agile way, if you like. Um, how do how do you see your clients managing that connectivity between those teams? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think what we've got now is that. Um, and obviously it's going to differ based on the scale of the organization okay so that some of the largest organizations they've got multiple horizon teams the smaller yep. ones may have a crisis team and then one looking at the future yep. um, but for those larger ones we're using a, a standard kind of scrum of scrum approach um, where we've got a we've almost got a, a crisis management leadership team which is effectively the executive in most uh, cases that we're working with right now yep. each product owner for each horizon is basically kind of coming back, sharing their scenario, sharing their backlog, and basically saying, look, this is what it looks like. And as uh, each product owner gets together and shares their backlog, um, the leadership team are then agreeing, what are the no regret actions, which will actually, uh, they should be working on regardless of what's going on, you know? And so that, that's how they're keeping connected. That's um, really, oh, sorry to interrupt, I was say, that's really interesting because that's, that's a, um, a procedure that, that, okay, you know, we, you mentioned before you know the scrum of scrums and things like this sounds like it's been done before actually strikes me that actually that's quite revolutionary uh, in in the way that um, agile is deployed very revolutionary in fact yeah i mean i think this is again again going back to all the people on the call today i mean this is where i think we can all help is that you know what what off what service and uh, capability can we provide to the the business leadership team there is um there is a, obviously the traditional approach to, to doing these crisis management is that you have a crisis management team holed up in some darkened room, mostly made of risk people and, and obviously the senior executive team. Uh, this where obviously this thing needs to be different, where we obviously need to drive more cross-functionality, more collaboration across the business. And obviously because of the uh, resource constraints the businesses are facing, this is really important now where we know that agile ways of working can increase Productivity and leverage, and re really increase the utilization of our of our people. Mm. Oh, okay, interesting. Um, just just thinking still about the horizon teams, the ones that are looking further out. Um, as you mentioned, all, they, all of the teams need to have data analytics people in them, customer experts, things like this. Is there room there actually, particularly for the ones looking further out, to engage actual customers? Yeah, I think I think all of them should be. Mm -hmm. and again, you know, some of our. I, I, I probably maybe don't need just overuse the retail side, but we're just doing quite a lot of work with them at the moment. But they are doing polls, not only in one country, they're going and polling countries they don't operate in. But, but uh, head right. of the so obviously I'm not sure if you've seen, but there's a lot of research going on in uh, China right now. Mm -hmm. and I know, for example, you know, one of our clients uh, basically is a European organization and they're polling immediately now, Italy, Spain, 
uh, Germany and looking at what the behaviors are of their customers, how they're feeling right now, how they're going to feel going forwards. And basically that's allowing them to basically then be further ahead of the game to, to kind of fill up their scenarios with better quality inf insights. And I said that that's very different to where they would be before because the data analytics team wouldn't be a part of that, of that, of that kind of organization really. It would be full of risk people and financial people just looking at what we're going to do with our balance sheets. Excellent. Thank you very much indeed. And uh, the, one of the dangers of hosting a, a, a webinar, people, is that your phone alarm might go off and it's on the other side of the room. So if anybody noticed that, just pretend it didn't happen. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and well covered, Vikram. Thank you very much indeed. That was great. Um, yeah, the, the one, I'm going to launch the poll now just to decide what we should be covering in, in, in the next session in a month. In the meantime, though, I'm just thinking about are there things that you can think of that organisations should not be doing? Obviously, we know what they, they what we would like them to do. Are there things which they should not be doing? Oh, that's a good question. Um, yeah, it is did, <laughs> and it wasn't one that we rehearsed earlier. Um, <laughs> well, I, well, it'd probably it'd be easy for me to say that that you know I guess you shouldn't be just trapped in focusing on the day to day, and it would be a very flippant remark to say. But you know, on a serious nature. The, the, I think it's really important to keep an eye on the future and even if it's the next month or so. Um, we have seen quite a lot of organizations um, really struggle with resourcing uh, teams which are looking a bit forwards. Um, but there's so many opportunities as well as threats that exist in this market. We've seen, I mean, I was just watching the um, Philips do their results yesterday on CNBC and what they're saying is actually they're going to take a dip in this quarter, but actually they see that, that at the end of the year they're going to be up because of all the opportunities that exist, providing kind of medical equipment and things like that. So um, I think, yeah, just don't get trapped in just looking at the short term. Um, there is capacity. And again, there's a lot of people out in the organization which we can really leverage. It doesn't have to be the most people who need to be involved in these teams. Uh, absolutely. And, and um, I was going to mention that, that uh, two things really. Um, one is, if we think about ourselves as individuals, if something suddenly happens, we can either react or we can respond. We can either do the knee-jerk um, uh, immediate or we can say, we can pause and say, what does that mean? This is what I need to do about it. And I think that, as you mentioned, not getting trapped by the immediate, actually it's okay for organizations to, to mentally to pause and then think about what do we do next. Um, that being the case, um, there are some, you mentioned there the idea that some, uh, we'll call it unusual members of the Agile team. So uh, in a sense, so yes, we want data analysts, we want uh, customer experts, we want it. But there might be, particularly in organizations which are not used to working in an Agile way, people who are who have unexpected understanding of the marketplace. And, and I mean, not just in terms of the division they work in, but the layers they work, the level they work at as well. And in a, in a retail sense, one might include the, the, the people who are doing the deliveries who probably have more knowledge of how customers feel at the moment than anybody else on the planet, I would think, really. Does, does that make sense in, in the sense of spreading the, um, the nature of the people in the, in the team? Yeah, yeah, I think I completely agree. You know, I, th I think, um, as I said, we've got one organization we're just about to kick off some work with and supporting them through this crisis point. And um, I was saying, oh, we need to just get all the leadership teams together over the next couple of weeks to run some workshops. Yes. And it is, um, it is a, an easy thing to fall into because they're the ones perhaps with, the, with maybe a little bit of, they've got that 50,000 foot view, but obviously we should be getting in some people who are actually talking to the customer, engaging the business on a daily basis, managing the operations. That, that obviously is what we advocate. I'm assuming all the people on this call is cross-functional teams who can design, build and run, yep. run solutions, right? So that, that's yep. a definite uh, requirement. Excellent. Thank you very much. I'm going to um, I'm going to end the poll, by the way, now that we've been running. So the, the topic said using an agile mindset um, and how to create high performing teams look like the currently the most popular ones. Um, incidentally, I'm seeing some questions also on the side here, um, and I don't want you to think that we're ignoring those at all. I'm just having a look at a couple of them. Um, we, we any that we any and all that we don't answer in this conversation, we will answer later on. Uh, and if you're happy um, to let us share um, your contact details with people, we can obviously share the answers to those questions with you uh, afterwards as well. Um, let's have a look, see just if the, um, 
Okay. Um, yes, from, from Jed in, in Poland, actually. I believe organizations got pretty professional level in terms of quantitative data collection and analyses. Um, this Revolution 4 is about building qualitative insights. Do, and and I, I like the feel of that. Do you think that that's right? Yeah, um, if you're asking me, yes. I mean, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, we're very lucky. We've, I think we're working with about four or five chief data officers uh, at the moment. And you can definitely see the importance of unstructured uh, data analytics is, is definitely there now. Um, and it's, yeah, exactly right. Especially when we're looking into consumer sentiments uh, and what that could in, what would that infer in terms of uh, the impact on business performance. Yeah, it's super, super important. Uh, absolutely, and, and and one from um, from Zarina, who I think is in the Isle of Wight, who, who talks about behavioural science and applied neuroscience being used to analyse some of this stuff. Now, what is interesting for me about that, and and, and it is. It is the depth of analysis that now needs to be applied to consumer behavior, whether that's in, in consumer goods or capital goods or whatever it is, because this applies to absolutely everybody, um, to the degree that, that there are probably no longer any assumptions that organizations can make about how their markets behave. Is that a, is that a fair assumption, do you think? Oh, I made an assumption. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, I mean, it's, it's all to play for, isn't it? I mean, it, it creates huge amounts of threats for those businesses which potentially are inflexible, and it creates huge amounts of opportunity for those which which are open to be more flexible and reinvent themselves. Um, you know, every single company I know has been surprised about what's going on. Um, we're working with a large cereal manufacturer, which, you know, this year was going to be a big year anyway, but, I mean, they have been a, obviously a crazy year because of who would have known that the demand for corn and things like that would have been so high um you know yeah it's so many uncertainties and why agile yeah. is working i think is is just a great way of approaching this and that's where we should all be supporting and educating our leadership teams to to embrace some of those principles well, uh, yeah, as I mentioned before, the fact that we are ourselves consumers uh, uh, and we can think in terms of how our behavior looks. I know and knew some weeks ago that the demand for cereal would be enormous because the demand for cereal in our house is absolutely huge, really. Yeah. So uh, and it's quite interesting, this idea of extrapolating from our behavior because we're not normally used to doing that. I'm just about to launch the, the second of our two polls, which is basically about how you're feeling about this session. So I'll just leave that open until the end where we've got about three minutes left to go. Um, in the meantime um uh, actually how are you feeling about this is uh, uh, vikram how are you feeling about the the prospects for your clients because they're doing the right things they've got horizon teams underway they're using the right spread of people in those teams stuff like that they're obviously we are all here as, as as a resource as well do you think that generally speaking this is the right stuff sorry the enough people are doing the right stuff for us to get a, a, a pull upwards in the economy when the opportunity arises um i'm not sure i could be qualified to answer such a big question <laughs> based on based on what we're seeing i mean it, it's amazing how people are how, how organizations are coming together um to achieve some incredible things as a result of this and you know going back to our agile principle we've got a common goal we've got you know much better decision making and we are genuinely being encouraged forced if not to work cross-functionally to get things done um, we've got one client, for example, which is spending, I think they've tried to spend one and a half years trying to integrate various different data bases together, manage, you know, having to go through all of the politics and all the bureaucracy to get people to agree to give all their data up. They did it in a week as a result of COVID crisis and then having to get a, a 360 degree view of all of their customers across all brands. Right. This is what we're people doing. So I think, I think there's incredible things going on right now. Um, uh, I think, I think uh, that's in how they're reacting to right now. I think thinking about the long term, I think this is, I guess, what we're kind of pushing forward to today and, and with some clients is that now we need to start applying that to uh, the more strategic challenges, which, which is slightly more difficult because that burning platform necessarily is not necessarily so uh, clear and so much in front of us. Yeah, and I think the, the somebody said to me the other day, the key word in this whole situation is acceleration. And I thought, yeah, I, that's right. However, it should not blind us to the fact that actually um, we, d we shouldn't be running so fast that we fall over. This is not just about the immediate, as you quite rightly said. And in fact, this whole session has been about the fact that this is not just about the immediate. Um, we are coming um, in a minute or so to the end of the session. I'm, I'm very pleased to see that um, so many people seem to be reasonably happy with it. 
it. Um, no money changed hands in the formation of this uh, survey, I should mention that. Uh, but thank you very much indeed. And I would like to say um, in closing, first of all, thank you very much, of course, to Vikram uh, and to Jacob for, for the content in this. Thank you to you, all of you, uh, for dialing in to, to listen to this. The recording will be available and we will answer any of those questions which were, uh, which were not covered uh, in the course of the conversation. Uh, and I hope to see you all and many more on the 27th of May. Thank you very much indeed, everybody. Have a great week and have a good month between now and the 27th of May. Thank you, Vikram. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye.